evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Imagine you went to school with Sandy Cortez. A lot of people did. Imagine it's 2011 and you're both students at Boston University, a not quite prestigious but highly expensive school for kids who couldn't get into Tufts. You know who Sandy Cortez is because three days a week at 1220, you see her in your philosophy of gender and sexuality class. She's always there in the front row snapping her gum. And then like clockwork, she never misses your queer theory seminar, which meets every Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Because if there's one thing about queer theory scholars, they're not early risers. Sandy goes to both and she talks a lot in both classes. She jumps into the conversation whenever she feels she has something important to say, which is frequently. She's hardly a genius, but she is highly self-assured. She's got strong opinions about racism and cosmetics. She seems to spend a lot of time updating her Facebook page. Those are the main things that you remember about Sandy Cortez. Now, fast forward 10 years. Suddenly, Sandy Cortez is a world famous figure, somehow. She's calling herself Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, like some kind of female Che, Westchester County's first socialist revolutionary. And she's still yammering on about racism and eyeshadow, her twin obsessions. And she's still frantically updating her social media pages. Some things have not changed. But other things have changed. One night, you're watching TV and you see Sandy Cortez talking authoritatively about America's energy grid, like she knows a lot about it. And that stops you in your tracks. Wait a second. The energy grid? That's an adult thing, right? That's not queer theory. That's real. That's a very complicated piece of infrastructure. Even a lot of engineers don't really understand how the energy grid works. How could Sandy Cortez possibly know anything about that? She can't drive a standard transmission. She can't program a coffee maker. She doesn't even make her own bed in the morning. The energy grid? Please. It seems preposterous. So you grab a beer and you settle in to watch her talk about it. And your jaw hangs open as you do. Here's what you see. We know that there is no such thing as cheap energy because the price of cheap energy has always been our lives. The trampling of indigenous rights is a cause of climate change. The, the trampling of racial justice is a cause of climate change. We're like, the world is gonna end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. And your biggest issue is, your, your biggest issue is how are we gonna pay for it? Mm -hmm. And like, this is the war, this is our World War II. The fossil fuel industry and the future of humanity are fundamentally incompatible. They just are. I mean, that's not a political opinion. That is the science. We continue to burn fossil fuels. Our planet will become inhabitable. <laughs> really? Energy, huh? How's energy generated, do you know? What's a watt? What's amperage? Speak slowly. We've got time. But she doesn't. Instead, she goes, the fossil fuel industry and the future of humanity are fundamentally incompatible. They just are. I mean, that's not a political opinion. That's the science. Of course it is. That's the science. Whatever I say is the science. There's no debate here. Obey. <laughs> but that's not how democracy works. Thank God. You actually have to convince people. And so she tried. She introduced the Green New Deal three years ago. And it didn't go far. In fact, it went nowhere. In fact, virtually nobody in Congress supported it. In fact, when it came time for a vote on the Green New Deal, even... Her co-sponsor, the other guy who wrote it, the super woke senator from Massachusetts, voted present, not in favor. Now, why is that? Why did nobody actually support it? Well, because if you think cow flatulence is even in the top 200 top issues for most Americans, you're Sandy Cortez. Go back to queer theory class. Get rid of fossil fuels? Yeah, what then? Well, starvation, poverty, societal collapse, Voters, it turns out, are not into any of those things. And so nothing that resembles the Green New Deal is going to pass the United States Congress in our lifetimes, provided this remains an actual democracy, which is to say, provided the public has anything to say about how they're governed. So that's a non-starter here. It's never going to happen by democratic means. But that doesn't mean it can't happen. It doesn't mean that ideologues can't impose the Green New Deal on weaker countries that are too poor to refuse it. And over the past several years, that's exactly what they've done. So the Green New Deal has actually taken effect around the world. So we don't have to guess about what would happen if it took effect here. We can know that's science. Let's start with Ghana. Ghana's a pretty little country, peaceful place, actually, on the west coast of Africa. 
Three years ago, Ghana was in great shape. It had one of the fastest growing economies in the world. In fact, it had so much energy over most of the last decade, it was exporting it to its neighbors in West Africa. Now, those energy exports from Ghana peaked in 2014. Why that year? Well, because the next year, the World Bank published this headline on its website, quote, World Bank approves largest ever guarantees for Ghana's energy transformation. Ooh, when they promise to transform your energy, slow down. But Ghana didn't slow down. They just kept going. And the World Bank promised to provide, and we're quoting, technical assistance for energy sector reforms and the drafting of a new renewable energy law. So in return for all this help, Ghana agreed to limit its carbon emissions. And then they entered the Paris Climate Agreement. Oh, how virtuous. What happened next? This is the part you don't read that much about. Last year, Ghana experienced a complete shutdown of its national power supply. Oh, no more electricity. <laughs> no emissions because we have no electricity. And blackouts have continued since then. Just yesterday, a news source in Ghana reported that, quote, residents in parts of the Ashanti region who have been hit with power cuts are without water as well. Because it turns out you need electricity to provide water also to grow food. Now, this is not a small thing. The Ashanti region has millions of people living in it. They're all now living in the Stone Age. And it's not just the energy grid that's now compromised in Ghana. International observers say the country is now facing severe food shortages and hunger, starvation within a matter of months. Why is that? It's a fertile country, hardworking people. Well, now they're running out of fertilizer. Why? Well, because for years, Sandy Cortez's friends in the NGO community pushed Ghana toward less efficient, more expensive organic fertilizers. And the government of Ghana, because it's not a rich government, caved. Last year, according to Ghana's news service, Ghana's agricultural minister, quote, urged local farmers to adopt an organic agriculture system to reduce the impact of climate change. Oh, what happened then? Well, the good people of Ghana, while they feel good about their fight against climate change, are now starving. And in June... Last month, police in Ghana used water and tear gas to attack hundreds of demonstrators in Accra, which is the capital of Ghana. Now, it's not just Ghana. The same thing just happened in Sri Lanka. In 2016, the World Economic Forum published an article by a Columbia professor called Joseph Stiglitz, one of the dumbest people on planet Earth, urging Ghana to transition to, quote, high productivity organic farming. Now, what does Stiglitz know about farming? Ever farmed? No. But he felt strongly that Sri Lanka should try a new kind of farming and, of course, sold it to Sri Lankans as a pathway to prosperity. In 2015, the World Economic Forum published an article on its website entitled, and we're quoting, this is how we will make Sri Lanka rich by 2025. You can search for that article, but it's gone now, along with the government of Sri Lanka. So they had an actual insurrection, not January 6th, not a guy in horns and a bearskin running around on mushrooms making weird noises. No, an actual insurrection where they like come to your house and swim in your swimming pool, root through your sock drawer and make you leave. That's what they did to the people who run Sri Lanka, they being the public. The turning point came in 2021 when the president of Sri Lanka, acting on advice from the World Economic Forum, banned the use and importation of chemical fertilizers. Now, the problem was virtually every farm in Sri Lanka used those fertilizers to produce food, which it turns out people need every day in order to survive. As a result of that move, food prices in Sri Lanka nearly doubled. Millions more Sri Lankans now live in poverty, which is not a joke. And because the economy has collapsed, Sri Lanka now cannot afford fuel imports. So Sri Lankans are now waiting days for gasoline. Watch. 36-year-old Thuvan, an auto rickshaw driver, has spent two nights at this gas station in central Colombo. It's been an endless wait to refuel his three-wheeler. Petrol pumps are all but dry across the city. <laughs> At every petrol station we go to, they tell us they have run out of gas. With no fuel, Thovan has been out of work. He leaves his rickshaw in the care of friends and heads home to meet family, where the situation is equally dire. There's been a crippling shortage of cooking gas across the island nation. Thovan's wife, Fatima, has been cooking on a kerosene stove for the last three months. I only have this one bottle of kerosene left. It'll finish after I heat the food tonight. What's so interesting is millions of people are now really suffering. The government just fell in Sri Lanka. Now, no one in Sri Lanka is white. They're all what 
our Democratic Party would call people of color. And yet the American intellectuals who pushed that disaster in Sri Lanka, who are responsible for the suffering there, have escaped all culpability. No one is saying a word about it. Meanwhile, a cop in Minneapolis was rough with a convicted felon two years ago, and we have to stop everything and send him to prison for life. But Joseph Stiglitz is totally fine. And it's not just happening, by the way, in the third world. It's happening even in rich countries. The Netherlands, for example, which is a very rich country, the second biggest food exporter in the world, tried to do, for reasons that are not clear, but may have to do with Western guilt, the same thing that leaders in Sri Lanka tried to do. They just ordered farmers to cut virtually all of their nitrogen oxide emissions to, quote, save the environment. Now, doing that would shutter most farms in the Netherlands and destroy the country's food supply. And once again, that led to riots. So everything that's happened in Sri Lanka and Ghana and the Netherlands is happening at the behest, not simply of ideologues, but of some of the largest financial institutions in the world. They want more of this. It's why Ghana has achieved a near-perfect ESG environmental impact score of 97.7. According to World Economic Research, Sri Lanka has an ESG score of 98.1. The Netherlands, 90.7. So the poorer you get, the more human suffering there is, the higher your ESG score. And that's important because companies will not invest unless you have a high ESG score. Interesting. So these countries have no choice. And that's why South Africa, for example, worked so hard to get an ESG score that now totals 91. Now, that effort began in 2015 when South Africa switched to renewables. Now, how did that work? Well, like everything in South Africa, no one in America really wants to know. It's their favorite country. It's a huge success. What's life like in South Africa for people of all colors? <laughs> Stop. Well, The Guardian, of all places, reported at the time, and we're quoting, Solar, biomass, and wind energy systems are popping up all over the country and feeding the clean energy into the strained electrical grid. So their grid's been falling apart since 1994, but no problem. The green energy geniuses are going to save South Africa. How'd that work? Well, seven years later, the Washington Post reports that South Africa regularly experiences, quote, rolling blackouts that last eight hours or more, crippling economic activity and disrupting life in this nation of 60 million people. And that's true. Ask anyone who lives there. It's falling apart. It doesn't work. Also true in France. France is committed to renewable energy. How's that working? Well, France currently has an ESG environmental score of 92.6. Why? Because 10 years ago, France pledged to derive a quarter of all of its energy from renewables. In 2018, these policies led to riots. Remember the so-called yellow jackets? People didn't like it. If you cared about democracy, you would listen to them, but no one in charge actually does, so they don't. And things have gotten worse since then. This past June, the heads of three French energy companies called on the public to, quote, immediately reduce consumption of fuel, oil, electricity, and gas amid shortages and soaring prices. Oh, stop civilization. It doesn't work. That same month, France's president publicly begged Joe Biden to start producing more oil because the Saudis cannot make enough to supply Europe. Watch. Two seconds. One, I'm at the maximum, maximum. What he claims, and this is my ticket for the second for me. According to us, the, the Saudis can increase a little bit, but one hundred fifty or a little bit more, and they, they don't have huge capacities. At this stage, before six months time. So only the Europeans have been dumb enough to embrace this. Unlike Ghana, they could afford not to, but they are anyway, out of some weird sense of collective guilt. So what's happening throughout Europe. In the UK, ESG score of 92.7, the National Infrastructure Commission has warned that as many as 6 million households could face power cuts this summer. Sound like the first world? No, it doesn't, but that's England now. In Germany, ESG score 90.2, the government is now rationing hot water due to an ongoing gas crisis. Officials in Hamburg, Germany's second largest city, just warned that, quote, warm water could only be made available at certain times of the day in an emergency. Now, it was just a few years ago that Germany's government laughed at warnings from Donald Trump that this would happen. It's on video. Oh, they are so stupid. You have no idea. Green energy is the future. <laughs> Every place that's been tried has fallen apart. Every single one, with no exceptions. Albania, Kenya, Argentina, Peru, Ecuador, Panama, Libya, so on. But it's not just a problem there, it's becoming a problem here. So in the United States, our ESG score on environmental issues currently stands at 58. But Joe Biden, who buys into every stupid trend, wants to change that. It's very important to get our ESG score up because we want to be more like Ghana. 
So at the very moment that Biden is sending our strategic petroleum reserve, which we own, he doesn't, to his son's business partners in China, he is vowing to end fossil fuels in this country and boost our ESG score. Watch. Would there be any place for fossil fuels, including coal and fracking, in a Biden administration? No, we would, we, would, we would work it out. We would make sure it's eliminated and no more subsidies for either one of those, either any fossil fuel. No we, more subsidies for fossil fuel industry. No more drilling on federal lands. No more drilling, including offshore. No ability for the oil industry to continue to drill, period. But I want you to look in my eyes. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, we're going to end fossil fuel and I am not going to cooperate with you, okay? So let's just be really clear. Fossil fuels aren't just not bad. Fossil fuels aren't just a net good. Fossil fuels are the only thing that stands between the United States becoming Ghana. Fossil fuels are the only thing that make the United States a rich country and not a poor country. We have the largest recoverable oil reserves in the world. If we can't tap those, we will be Ghana. We will be poor. But Joe Biden doesn't care. And so he is clamping down on our ability to extract them. And like the leaders of every other country, driven into the ground by green energy schemes, thought up by morons like Sandy Cortez, he's taking no responsibility for the damage he has caused. Look, we need more refining capacity. This idea that they don't have oil to drill and to bring up is simply not true. This piece of the Republicans talking about Biden shut down fields, wrong. There are 9,000 of them, okay? So they, and then we ought to be able to work something out whereby they're able to increase refining capacity and still not give up on transitioning to renewable energy. Problem is, he doesn't know anything about refining or extracting or how the grid works or anything about anything, because he's never had a real job because he worked for the federal government since he was in his 20s. None of these people have any experience doing anything. Again, most of them can't drive a manual transmission. So to get a lecture on the power grid or energy from people who have no idea what it is, is a bit much. And the topic is too important to continue to listen to their nonsense as we become poorer. And by the way, as the rifts just beneath the surface in American society are exacerbated by that poverty. As GDP drops, societal tension rises. It's dangerous. Back off. And it's accelerating. In the past year, the United States has experienced blackouts in some of our biggest states. Why? Because they're relying more and more on renewables. Places like California and even Texas. Just yesterday, in order to avoid a blackout, the largest grid operator in the state of Texas begged residents to turn up their thermostats, no more AC for you, and asked them not to use any major appliances, really, in Texas which has the largest oil and gas reserves in the continental United States. What are they doing in Texas? But across the country, this is true. Orlando, Florida recently experimented with fertilizer bans to, quote, curb pollution. So the World Economic Forum wants a lot more of this. They just released a position paper calling for countries to, quote, agree to end the underpricing of fossil fuels, which is the principal factor preventing a clean energy transition. In other words, it's too cheap. It works too well. Gas needs to be higher. So you won't be able to use it. So you'll have to be poor. And they're saying this as we're watching countries around the world, we could give you more detail, you see the point, are collapsing and entering into a state of revolution because these morons tampered with their energy grids. But they don't care. And they're going to continue doing it unless someone stops them until exactly the same thing happens here. That's true. Subscribe to the Fox News YouTube channel to catch our nightly opens, stories that are changing the world and changing your life. I'm Tucker Carlson tonight.